the final three weeks of our study through the last book of the Bible, through Revelation. And uh, this is an interesting week because this week uh, we have to remember to look where John looks and listen to what John uh, hears. And this is a moment that doesn't feel linear. It doesn't feel like it fits with the rest of the book because it, it's not what happens next. It's what, we, what John sees next and hears next. And what, what we have today is an origin story. And I don't know about you, I'm a sucker for a good origin story. I will watch them all. I don't care how good or bad they are, but I, I mean, I, I love them. And uh, I'm always so fascinated, uh, whether it's Wicked or The Hobbit or a DC character or a Marvel character. Like I, I love thinking about how did we get here? I, I, I don't know, uh, Marbitz, I don't know if I'll lose favor with you, but I'll be honest, like I, I I grew up, I went to the drive-in movie to see Star Wars and all the first, you know, those, those movies. And so when I heard that they were going to make three more movies, I was like, you know, thrilled beyond belief. And I know a lot of you hate those movies. Uh, you, you don't like watching them. But I actually really enjoyed the origin story of Anakin Skywalker, right? To think about how did Darth Vader become Darth Vader? And you, you're introduced to this little kid, kind of has this uh, Jude speak vibe. He's cute and fun and... <laughs> And uh, he's smart. He's like too smart uh, for everyone else. And uh, you, you love him. And then, uh, you, but, you, but like origin stories start to get to, you know, the thing beneath the thing. And so we start seeing all the dynamics of the force and the dark side and all these different things happening. And, and you start to see this character who you actually have really fallen in love. Like you love this guy and you're, you're worried for him going through it. And then it explains all this stuff. And then it makes sense of, of all the stuff later. Uh, Good origin stories do that. They, they answer these questions. How, how did we get here? How did we really get here? And what's the thing beneath the thing? What's the story beneath the story? And last week, we, we were saying that if, if we're going to have faithful witness, we have to know our origin story. You need to be able to articulate your origin story. And so I, I want to encourage you at the back of your little journal, if you have it, uh, I would love for you to be able to write out what your story is. Um, and the way that uh, we've, we did this last week is we said, uh, think about these three questions. Uh, what was happening before Jesus, before you met Jesus? What was happening in your life? How did you come to Jesus? And what has uh, begun to change? What, what, where do you notice change? And if you can articulate that on that small little page uh, in bullet points or, or writing it out, uh, chances are you could probably tell that story in two to three minutes. And this is, a, I think, a hope for us is we, we need to know our story because someone's going to encounter you as a faithful witness and say, how did you get here? How, how did you become a follower of Jesus? And you're able then to walk them through. And the purpose of this book of Revelation is that we are, are seeing, it is to encourage and inspire loyalty in us, that we become faithful to the end. Uh, it is to transfer all of our devotion and all of our worship to Jesus. That, that we're not going to give devotion, allegiance, worship to anything or anyone else. And that's the, the challenge so far in this book is that we see that people are giving worship uh, to other beings. That uh, they are giving allegiance to other, other powers. And we need to see how important it is that we are giving only to Jesus. And so one of the things that's great about the book of Revelation is it helps us understand two things. It helps us understand this present moment in light of future reality. So future unseen things. So what we're seeing in some ways is God is playing out this divine plan. And we know this, is all, this, this life is all going somewhere. It's going to the restoration of all things. And, and I'm, I'm super excited in two weeks when we get there uh, Justin will take us through that, and it's going to be it's going to be such a good day uh, as we think of this. Next two weeks are so good as we start to see it all. It's all going somewhere. It's been hard, and I need you to endure for half a, a sermon more, and then it, it just gets good coming out. But as we do this, we we see it's all pushing somewhere. God is working out His plan, but we also understand this present moment in light of the unseen realities of the of the present. That what we start to understand in reading this book is that there is, there, things are not as they seem. There's more going on. And, and I, what I think we find is, hey, I want to be faithful, but it's hard. Uh, the tension that we are wrestling with is, I'm, I'm try, I want to do the right things. I want, I want to live faithfully to God, but man, it's just, it's hard. 
And we want to say, well, why is it hard? And one of the things that you're going to see today, and it's what we've been singing about all morning, is that you are in a battle. And there are powers that are seeking to keep you from loyalty and obedience. Uh, but we know this. Uh, we know that Jesus came into this world to ransom us from those powers, to rescue us from those powers. So here's the big idea I want you to see today is this, is that uh, I want you to see that there's two sides that we have to understand, that there is a dragon who is looking to destroy your life. So on the one hand, we have to understand, I'm going to try to paint the picture that Revelation gives us, that there is a dragon and his beast, and ultimately, no matter how seductive they try to entice you, it is always, it is always leading towards destruction, your destruction. But the other side of this is this, uh, the lamb has given his life for you. So one has come to take your life, the other comes and gives his life for you. And the more you see this and the more you understand this, the more you realize, I want to give everything to the lamb. I don't ever want to trust the dragon. I don't ever want to trust his temptation, his voice, or any of those things. Because no matter how enticing it is, it's always trying to destroy me. And so I hope you'll see today the true nature of the enemy. You'll become more aware of, of the ways that he works. But that you will understand, uh, we'll understand a little better how to walk faithfully with the one who's given himself for us. So turn to Revelation 12. It's page 42 in the little journals, or if you use the Bible in front of you, uh, just go all the way to the back, work backwards. And this is a flashback. It is in some ways a summary of the book, and in many ways the Bible, but you are in a battle. And here's the fascinating thing, is you're going to see that you are in a battle, but if you, will, if you will listen and read closely, what you'll discover is, uh, we win. Uh, I mean, I hate to spoil the end of the book, but, but you see it even in this halfway point. We win. And you get to work from there. So I don't know if you're a baseball fan, if you were watching game one of the World Series, but I will say, <laughs> you knew. Uh, you knew. But let me say, so this is a funny story. So Friday night, if you were watching the game, it was, it was an incredible game if you're on the good guy's side. It was very tense. It was very tense. And it got to the very end of the game, and it looked like you're just like, we were, at least in our, our space, there's seven of us watching, and we're like complaining of all the missed opportunities, all the reasons why we're, we're I can't believe we're going to lose this game, and the world's going to end, and all these things that are going to happen. And then the thought is this, if one guy gets on, then Shohei gets up, and he will win the game. And so one guy gets on, two guys get on, like, oh my gosh, baseball's amazing, it's so romantic, it, Shohei's going to do it, it's going to be, it's a fairy tale, I, I don't know how, this is God's game. And so Shohei gets up, he pops up, the guy catches the ball, falls into the stands, the runners advance, they walk a guy, so then they bring up Fountain Valley born Freddie Freeman, cousin of Nate Davis, I don't know if he's here, but uh, uh, he comes to the plate, and then you're like, well, this could be even better because this, he gets the hero. He's had this really rough uh, situation these past months. And we're all sitting there like all worked up. If he, if he could just, if he, if he, if he, if he uh, and we're just like, we're pacing. Uh, one of the, six of us are frantically pacing. And one guy just kind of stands. He kind of just quietly moved to the back of the room and did this and started filming the, the room. <laughs> And I'm, I, I just watched him, I was like, okay, oh yeah, I should probably have my camera on in case, like, I'm just hoping for a base hit and see, see what happens. And all of a sudden, it's like, and we're saying, you know he's going to take the first pitch, if he could just get a six. And before you can even finish a thought, he hits just an absolute tank into the right field. And all I could s scream was, what just happened? What just happened? What just happened? And we're, we're running around the garage, my son jumps up, falls, on, jumps on a table, breaks, like, this, it's just pandemonium. And the one guy standing back there just just calmly filming everything. And then we, we all calm down and just like, that was the greatest thing. I've, I, we've, I've never experienced it. it was a, I can't believe we got to experience that together. It was amazing. And he, he goes, I got a notification on my phone a minute before it happened. I knew he was gonna hit the home run. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, it's true. I knew. He, it's, my phone said, uh, Freeman Grand Slam, they win. And so he just very quietly stood back 
and filmed, filmed all of us. All of us are living in the anxiety of the moment. Like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Are we going to make it? And he just knew, guys, we win. We win. And I couldn't help but think about that. And I was like, man, this is so, this is so perfect for our, our experience right now through Revelation, isn't it? That we, we know, even if we know it, but we, we have the alert. We know we're going to win. Right? But a lot of us are still, we're just we're running around anxious in the midst of it all. Because we've got to still play out the game. And I want you to know this. Like this, when you see this, you're going to see there's a lot of reason for us to have uh, we have to be discerning, we have to be mindful, we have to be uh, diligent, but I want you to know we win. And so we're going to read this big long section. I remind you it's apocalyptic language. It's, it's this big language that make you feel like, wow, you're watching like this kind of big thing go on. We're up on the balcony trying to get a big picture view, so I can't go into all the details, but we'll try our best to uh, understand it a little better. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance, right? We're watching, what does John see next? I saw a woman clothed with the sun, the moon, beneath her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his head. And his tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule the nations with an iron rod, and her child was snatched away from the dragon and caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled in the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1260 days. And then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, the angels, and the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. The great dragon, the ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. And then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, it has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. And when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to a male child. But she was given two wings like those of a great eagle so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she'd be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. And then the dragon tried to drown the woman with a flood of water that flowed from his mouth, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. And then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Now, if you were in first century, uh, this, this audience, this is making a ton of sense to your experience and more so as we look at uh, what comes next. Uh, but this is more than that. This is looking at the whole big uh, biblical drama playing out. And we, we have language, we have images, we have a woman. Uh, and the woman, uh, we understand first, is being faithful Israel, right? God's, this is God's people. And so the woman has this kind of morphing characteristic. You see her. Um, and so we see the, this imagery in the beginning of, this, of the star, star and moon and uh, uh, sun. Uh, all this is, comes from Genesis 37. It is Joseph's uh, vision. And so we understand uh, Israel and faithful Israel. The, the enemy started after uh, way back then. And then we see this, this woman who's giving birth. And all of a sudden we realize it's Christmas, right? This is the, the Christmas story. And here's the faithful woman giving birth. Mary, we know, is part of uh, faithful Israel. She is a ser- I am God's servant. Let it be for me, right? She's faithful. She's giving birth. And there's this big dragon kind of waiting there to devour the baby, uh, right? And this dragon, we, know, we come to find out, it, we know the son is Jesus, 
uh, we see that he is kind of snatched up from the birth and then to the throne. And so it's like this from birth to ascension, he's after him. Uh, and then he's going to go after uh, his offspring. If he can't get him, he'll go after his offspring. And it's this powerful thing. And, and so, it, I mean, the, the Christmas piece is so interesting, right? Like you've got this picture. I, we've got a couple houses in our neighborhood. They've got these big inflatable dragons uh, for Halloween. And I was thinking, I wonder if I could borrow those for Christmas. And I'm going to set up a, a nativity scene. And then I'm going to put a big inflatable dragon next to it. And everyone's going to be like, what is wrong with this guy? I'm like, no, no, no. This is the biblical story. Uh, can I explain it to you? And I'm pretty sure everyone will avoid me in my neighborhood. But... But you have this, and you have this idea of three and a half years, 1260 days, time, uh, times and half a time. He has a short amount of time. That's the, the emphasis, uh, specific or not. Uh, notice this dragon. Verse 9 says, he is the devil. It's Satan. He's got horns and crowns and uh, all these different images, seven heads. Like there's, the, uh, his tail wipes out a third of the stars. He, he's powerful, right? The, the imagery here is he has authority, has power in this world. Um, he will lose. We're told six times that he is thrown down, right? This is what we see. He, he has turned his anger, though. This, the end of this, what you see is he's turned his anger towards the church, towards those who keep God's commandments, who maintain their testimony. So I want you to see, the first thing you had, uh, uh, there's two things to, uh, for today. We've got to understand the dragon and the lamb. First, the dragon. The dragon comes to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal, kill, and destroy. No matter how enticing, no matter how good the temptation is, know this, the, the, the goal of the dragon is always to destroy you. He will work the long con or he will bring it right in right away. But he is always looking to steal, kill, and destroy. This, literally, these are not my words. These are Jesus' words. John 10, 10, he says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. I mean, this is Jesus speaking of this. And Jesus gets to speak as a firsthand witness. He knows he was there. He wanted to devour me at my birth. We know the story um, uh, it, well, we don't like, love to tell the story. It's, a, it's such a dark story. But remember, King Herod had all the babies killed in, in Bethlehem two years or younger, right? It, uh, from the very beginning, he's after him. J uh, Jesus in Luke 4, we see, goes to his family, to his hometown. He reveals that he's the Messiah and they try to push him off a cliff, right? He's after him his whole time. Uh, uh, Mark 4, uh, Jesus is in a boat, and he's with seasoned veteran fishermen. And they're freaking out because the storm has raged like they've never experienced. And they're waking Jesus up because they, they believe they're going to drown. And Jesus, with a word, says, silence. He it says he rebukes the wind and the waves. It's the same word that he uses uh, uh, for the demons. He rebukes the demons. He rebukes the wind and the waves. It's almost as if something kind of satanic is kind of built up on the sea trying to kill him. And he, just a word, he just says silent and the wind and the waves stop and everyone in the boat's like, what just happened? Who is this that wind and waves obey him? Paul tells us you are in a battle. So put on the armor of God. Peter says it this way. He says, stay alert, watch out uh, for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now on our own, we have no power. Like don't mess with this stuff. This is, I, I, this kind of, Season, I, I don't like this season. I don't like Halloween and all this stuff. Um, I don't like when people uh, flirt with this stuff. It's, it's real. It's powerful. And it's, it, we, we've got to uh, understand something. That in our own power, we really can't fight this stuff. Uh, but we do know that in the name of Jesus, uh, we have power. That, that at the name of Jesus, the darkness trembles. We see it all through the Gospels. In fact, even then, you know, there's times where the disciples can't cast out a spirit and there's times where the, the disciples get sent out and they come back and they're like, 
That worked. And why did it work? Because they went out in the name of Jesus. Now, when we pray in the name of Jesus, that's not like the the official correct way Christians in prayers. It's not, it's not like the postage stamp that you put on a prayer to make sure it gets to heaven, okay? To pray in the name of Jesus is to say, God, I'm coming to you, not by my authority, but in the name of Jesus. I'm coming to you by his, his authority. I'm coming to you because I belong to him. And so when we battle the forces of of evil in the name of Jesus. We are not saying, I don't have any, I will get thumped. But in the name of Jesus, I have a power that I can't totally comprehend. So you have to understand this. You know, Hollywood always gets it wrong. The priests are always getting beat up and things like that. It's, It's just not that way. It's not a fair fight. Six times, thrown down, thrown down, thrown down, thrown down, thrown down thrown down, right? The Bible repeat, when the Bible repeats something it is to emphasize something. He is a loser. He has, the technical term is he's been bounced. I, I don't want to know how many of you have been bounced out of a bar. Um, you can tell me that story on the patio, but, but right? Some unruly character gets kind of tossed by the bouncer and this is what, how he's described. And so I want you to understand something that there, there is a power at work. We have to be discerning though. And this dragon, this dragon requires agents to do his dirty work. And so if you turn over a page to chapter 13, just really briefly, we see there are two beasts carrying out. Now again, he sees these beasts, one comes from the sea and one comes from the land. And again, it's, a, it's apocalyptic language. Uh, and so what he sees, what he knows uh, he begins to see something that, that is happening. First, he sees a beast come out of the sea, verse one. Then I saw a beast rising out of the sea. It had seven heads and 10 horns and 10 crowns on its horns. And written on each head were names that blasphemed God. Now, if you continue to read the descriptions, you realize uh, this is speaking of, of a beast. It's speaking of uh, the the. The power, the influence comes through uh, political means and they were experiencing this. They were experiencing a beast in Domitian. They had experienced a beast in Nero. They had experienced beasts in an empire that tried to coerce them and, and, and require them to give loyalty. And what's interesting about this beast is that it mimics the lamb. It's an impersonator. And so you see things like uh, horns and crowns, it has followers, a fatal wound, it's revived. It kind of feels like it's like this, like a bad Jesus costume it's wearing, right? But it has, it looks and kind of feels like the lamb. Uh, Then you have this next beast and the beast comes from the earth. And he says, then I saw another beast come out of the earth. He had two horns like those of the lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. Uh, it, again, there's an appearance of godliness, but there's deception. And this beast, again, is a, it, it's an impersonator. It mimics the Holy Spirit. And so you have miracles and signs and different things that we would attribute to the power of the Holy Spirit and here you have a, uh, the, the persuasion and the influence is religious in nature. And so you have this kind of coerced uh, uh, powers of, of political persuasion, uh, these powers of religious, and the religious powers are trying to get these people to worship and give their allegiance to the first beast. And when religion loses its, its way, it, it, it seeks to become partners with power in all these things, we start to see uh, this kind of false trinity. I don't know if you, you see it. So you got the dragon who's like, the, uh, like God on the throne, right? The one that is wielding authority. And then you've got this beast from the sea that mimics the lamb and this beast of the earth that mimics the Holy Spirit. And you have this unholy trinity. And there's kind of this interesting moment that you, you have kind of wondering, like, how can you fight this? Now, here's, here's one thing. I'll just throw this one thing in there. 
There's so many other things. There's so many things we could throw in here, but I'm just going to throw this one because it gets talked about a lot. The beast of the earth, notice the, what it requires you to do is to take its mark. And what is the mark? 666, right? So everyone, you know, you, if you've grown up watching any kind of horror movies or whatever, um, you know, uh, you, you're kind of looking on your friend's head to see if he's got like a 666, you know, if he's kind of like a troublemaker, right? This idea of this mark of the beast. And once again, it's an impersonation. The mark of the beast is impersonating the seal of the lamb. They're, they're both marks. They're both seals. They're both saying, speaking of belonging and ownership. And, and who, do you, who do you belong to? Now here's what the, the mark of the beast is not. It is not Apple Pay or, or some other, uh, you know, something on your phone that you don't know about. It is not a microchip that you accidentally got when you got a vaccine, right? So all these kind of crazy ideas, and I'll, I'll be honest, I've grown up always like, always like kind of hesitating towards technology or something like, am I going to accidentally take the mark of the beast? And guys, stand back for just a second. When you hear these things and just say, how, how in the world could Jesus say to me, um, you gave your life to me, you worshiped me your whole being, but you accidentally took a microchip by, you know, and I can't let you in my kingdom, right? Let's just, when you hear these things, just kind of like, I don't have time for this. Let's move on, okay? Let's just move on. The mark impersonates. It's an impersonation. But what ultimately a mark is, notice the mark goes on the hand and the forehead. Where have we heard this before? You, uh, if you think all the way back to the, the great story of God's people coming in the promised land, they learn a prayer. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then he says this, these commandments I'm giving you today are to be on your heart, impress them on your children, talk about them on the road and when you're at home, uh, you're, and you're coming and you're going. Uh, mark them as symbols on your hand and your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your gate and or doorposts of your home and on your gates. Right? You're not supposed to literally write it on. And if you've got a cool tattoo or whatever, that's fine. But if you're not supposed to literally write it on your uh, hand or your forehead, it is symbolic. The, the, the forehead represents your, your ideas, your ideology, your worldview. Your hand represents your actions. And the idea is talk about God's ways all the time everyone, everywhere with everyone. So that everywhere you go, they see it in the way you think and the way you act. Show that you are marked by these commandments. The mark reveals who has shaped your ideology, who is shaping why you do what you do, your actions. And so we see this playing out and here's this old unholy trinity, and you have this moment in chapter 13, verse 4, like, how do, you, how do you possibly beat them? And it's mimicking, and once again, it's impersonating Psalm 8, right? We, we, we sing this, who is like the Lord? And of course, the answer is no one. Psalm 8 says, who is like the Lord? No one is like the, the Lord. And so when he says, who can, who can defeat him? You feel like no one can, except he does get defeated. He is defeated. See, everything about this unholy trinity is it is an impersonation of real life. This, this group comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And chapter 13 gives way. Here's how you, here's how you beat them. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, and we'll close with this. Then I saw the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had their name who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. The great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering. And God 
uh, to God and to the Lamb. They've told no lies. They are without blame. And so you have this other group who is marked, right? On the forehead, they have the name of the Father. They have the name of the Son. And the 144,000, we saw it's, it signifies completion. It's, it is God's people. It is, it is, it is the completion of, of Israel. It is the saints across history. It is this beautiful picture and they are singing this song. And the best way he can describe it, what does John hear? He's like, I, it's like if you close your eyes at Niagara Falls, just the roar of the waterfall. And he says, it was just, you realize just the most beautiful thing. They're singing the song of victory. They have been redeemed. You know, if I can make a quick, I love the idea of the roar of praise. Um, not this Monday, but next Monday. We are going to have a night of worship and prayer here, uh, November 4th. It's called Seek Week. Uh, all throughout Orange County, there's going to be these, these worship and prayer nights going on. And we're going to host Huntington Beach and Fountain Valley. I know of uh, 17 churches that are planning to try to send at least one person. It is going to be powerful. You want to hear the roar of praise. I want to encourage you to come that night. It's going to be powerful. And we're going to pray. We're praying. Yes, we're going to pray for the election. But more than that, we're praying that God brings a revival in our city. They're singing the song of victory. And how, why can they sing the song of victory? Because of Jesus. Jesus defeats his enemies through his sacrifice. We saw this earlier. He's worthy. He's worthy. Jesus defeats his enemies through his sacrifice. The lion becomes the lamb, the slain lamb. And through his sacrifice, his enemies are defeated. They now belong to the Father and the Son. And, and the beautiful picture is you start to see in chapter 14 that they are, because of his sacrifice, they are redeemed. This is a, a, a word that keeps getting used over and over again. They're rescued. We, we, don't, we don't win in our own power, our own strength. We don't, we don't save ourselves. How do you know if you're on the winning side? Well, because you have let God redeem you. You've let Jesus redeem you. You have made a decision of faith to come and say, I cannot save myself. Only you can save me. They're pure and blameless. Uh, that, that word virgin there is the idea of, it's a spiritual adultery, right? We're not, they haven't given themselves over to, to other loves and other gods. They're, they're pure. They're blameless. There's, there's no lie in them. Their life is an offering. And I love the idea that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Jesus defeats his enemies through his sacrifice. And those who have experienced it, this is what marks them. I am redeemed. I didn't save myself. Jesus saved me. I, I have made myself for him and him alone. I'm willing to follow him wherever he goes. And my life is an offering to him. And I love in chapter 14, chapter 15, you have these, these songs, these songs of victory. And so the, the question that we, we want to end with today is this. Whose mark do you bear? Whose mark do you bear? Right? It's, it's not this secret tattoo or anything like this. It is... If I were to look at you and say, this is what marks you. Is it the dragon? Is it the imprint of the dragon or is it the imprint of the lamb? See, our victory comes because of the work of Jesus on the cross and it comes by our faithfulness. And this is what, the, what it says. How do they win? Because of, because of what Jesus did for us and because we were faithful we're loyal to him. To be victorious over the dragon requires two things. It first requires a decision of faith. And let me say to any of you who have not made yet a decision of faith. To be a Christian doesn't mean you just show up in the room where other Christians are. 
To be a Christian is you have made a decision of faith. You have offered your life to Jesus and you have said to Jesus, only you can save me. Jesus, save me. And I, I will follow you wherever you lead. To emphasize Justin's announcement, uh, in a couple weeks we're doing a baptism. Baptism is the step that some of you in this room need to take. It is the step of obedience because you have come, you become a person of faith. You become a Christian. You just haven't declared it publicly yet. And baptism is the moment where you, you, in essence, are saying, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. My sins are washed away. My old life is dead and buried. And I'm rising out to live a new life of following him. If you have not been baptized, scan that QR code, Go on uh, our website, just find one of us. We would love to get you prepared for that. We want to celebrate. But those of you who are followers of Jesus know this. It's not just a decision of faith. It is decisions of faith. It is is us deciding day after day, moment after moment, that we want the way of the lamb, not the way of the dragon and his beasts. Because we know what the dragon wants for us, no matter how enticing it is, it always has a hook in it. It is always about your destruction. We make decisions time after time to be people of faith. Who is developing your ideas? Who is shaping your passions? Who is directing your actions? It tells you everything about who you've, who you've been marked by. And so let me invite us to stand as we close. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one last song together. In fact, choir, you can come up here. But let's close with this final song. And, and we want to sing this song. We're going to sing this song. There's going to be two aspects to this song as we sing it. Uh, this song is a prayer. It is a prayer for our city. It is a prayer for our church. It is a prayer asking God to bring his work, his revival here. That we want that. But there's a part of this song that that it shifts not just asking God to do something, but offering yourself in it. And I want to say, if you have never before given your life to Jesus, we're going to come to a point in the song. uh, I think a lot of us think this is one of Mitch's best songs he ever wrote, Mitch and Kristen. And someday he will record it by our insistent asking. Uh, But there's a beautiful part of it. It's just an offering of yourself. And I would just say, you can just close your eyes, whether you sing it out loud or in your heart, just to say, Lord, all my heart, all my life, all I am belongs to you. And today, give yourself to him. And so let's pray. Let's sing this as a prayer over everyone but also for ourselves. If you've been following Jesus, again, it's a decision today. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be faithful to the end. And so let's sing this final song.